Good morning, church. It is great to see you today. I've had some awesome time off in July, a couple of weeks of study break where I try each year to get ahead and uh, outlined the year for us finishing John and then the following year for us doing the book of Acts in a year. Looking forward to that. And then a couple of weeks of vacation, I even ended up in Charlotte for a few days because I had to get eyes on the fifth grandchild in the Sutherland family. That is Mo James. No kidding, Mo. The boy has even got rolls under his armpits. This is one healthy child, and he's uh, two months old and already 14 pounds and in charge. So we had a blast. I heard phenomenal things about Westside while I was gone. Uh, the attendance was strong in July. The giving was strong. But mostly what I heard about was the phenomenal job that all of those who taught did in the month of July. Would you like to give them a hand? Wow. We have a deep bench here on teaching. In fact, this is the first year I've been out four weeks and didn't get a single email saying, when are you coming back? I did get a couple that said, go ahead and take some more time off. So uh, it's been great, great time together. Grab your notes, if you will. We begin a new series today. And the name of the series is Love Proofs. Love Proofs. We're working our way through the Gospel of John. We've been here a year and a half. We come to John 13. Very fitting that we did communion today because on the night before he's crucified, Jesus has his communion time with his disciples and then launches into, in John 13, this teaching that says, I'm throwing down the gauntlet, guys. I'm tired of you just telling me that you love me. I want to know if you love me. I want to know if your words are going to be backed up by your talk. Are you going to walk it or not? And the big idea in this series called Love Proofs is this. You've heard it from me before. Love shows up. Would you write that in your notes? My favorite definition of love. Love shows up. For God so loved the world that he showed up, that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Love doesn't think about what you need to do. Love doesn't plan what you need to do. It just shows up and gets it done. So in the next few weeks, six weeks to be exact, we're going to work our way through John 13. Here's a little uh, weather prediction, if you will, a little spiritual weather forecast where we're going for the next six weeks. Today, we'll talk about love serves. Interesting that the God of this universe defined love as service first before anything else. Next week, we'll talk about love models because the reality in life, if you notice this with your kids, your grandkids, more is caught than is taught. They don't become what you say. They become who you are. There's a scary thought for you. They become who you are. Third week, love endures. How do you hang in there when it gets tough? How do you stay in a love relationship when forgiveness is required and grace is required? Week four, love honors. Love honors. It asks the question, how do I honor you? How do I lift you up? Week five, love follows. When you really love somebody, you really think about what they say. You really consider it. You really follow. And then lastly, love celebrates because the true sense of love is if something good is happening for you, I am going to rejoice. And if something crummy is happening with you, I'm going to weep with you. Weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. It's going to be a fun series, but it's going to run on two tracks. So let me give you both tracks. Some of you will flip back and forth over the six weeks. Track number one, how can I know if I really love somebody? How can I know if I really love them? I'm not talking about the mushy, gushy, wushy feeling stuff, okay? You may just have indigestion. Maybe you just had too much pizza last night, you know, and that's what you're feeling. Now, how do you know if you love someone, but bigger than that, how do I show my love for Jesus? I believe our God 
is looking for a generation of followers in the 21st century who talks less and does more. Who talks less and does more. Who shows up with love. Today, here's the big idea as we look at love serves. Love shows up in service. Love shows up in service. I love John 13. You guys have all figured out by now, every Bible passage we do is my favorite. And, uh, but really, John 13 is one of my favorites. And uh, I love how Jesus, the night before he's crucified, the night of his last chance to talk at length with all 12 disciples, notice how he starts. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Hear that love endures part? He loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God rose from supper he laid aside his outer garments love this took a towel tied it around his waist then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Let's pray together and ask God to speak. Would you join me? Father, your word is alive. It's active. It's sharp as a two-edged sword. And it's able, Lord, to speak to us. We ask you by your spirit to give us understanding and to give us an urgency to act today. Teach us how love serves is our prayer in Christ. Amen. First thing I want you to write down, number one here, love takes action. Would you put that in? Love takes action. It's not a feeling. It's an action. It's not an emotion. It's a behavior. Now, a couple of weeks back, a couple of months back, actually, we talked about this. Let me remind you of it. When you see the need, you meet the need. Write that down. When you see the need, you meet the need. It is not our calling in life to see a need. It's our calling in life to see the need and then to do something about it. Look at John 13 here. This is an amazing thing. The evening meal is in progress. Now, there's no way for me to make all the context of this passage come to life, but let me give it a shot. This is Thanksgiving meal, okay? As big as the Thanksgiving meal is to us in America, this is even bigger than that to them. It's the Passover meal. It's the night they celebrate God delivering them out of Egypt centuries before. And the meal has already started. And the tradition in Jesus' day is there's always a servant in the room to help you with the meal, especially on holiday meals. Some of you come to the 945 service at Lenexa, or you come to the, uh, to the 1020 service up at Speedway just so you can beat the Methodist to lunch. I know how this works. I mean, y'all are thinking y'all just came to this service to be spiritual. You like to get to the cafeteria before everybody else does. I, I get it. I get it. Works for me. We're purpose-driven eaters. No problem. <laughs> what would happen if you went to the restaurant this afternoon and a waiter never came? A waitress never showed up at the table. I mean, you'd be looking around going, what kind of place is this? What kind of service do they offer? You'd probably go find the manager and say, is there a chance somebody's going to wait on us today? You know, what, what, what's going on in this deal? Nobody is waiting on the rest of the group. Nobody is there to serve. And Jesus sees the need and meets the need. He gets up and does it himself. What's the point? Write this in. Don't just point out what needs to be done. Get it done. Oh, the kingdom of God is full of pointers. 
Look this way. Here's how a pointer acts. They walk through life. Ooh, ooh, there's too much trash on the ground here. We need to get somebody to pick up this trash. They walk through life. Uh, if they would coordinate this parking lot a little bit better, we'd be able to get out at the end of the day. They walk through life pointing out what's wrong and doing nothing about it. Let me give you my personal philosophy of pointers. Are you ready? We shoot them. <laughs> That's my philosophy. In Jesus' name, we shoot them. Yeah, you shoot the messenger. That's what you do. Because the call in the kingdom is not to point out what's wrong. That's the spiritual gift of critique, and it does not exist. The call in the kingdom is to see the need and to serve. Trash on the ground? Bend over and pick it up. Parking lot needs help? Pull your car out and volunteer. Something needs doing? Get it done. Now look at the next verse. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Could he have said, hey John, you're the young disciple, get up and serve us and wash our feet. He could have. Could he have called 10 angels into the room to come and to do it? He absolutely could have. Could he have told any one of the 12 disciples, get up and get this done? Yes. But the point is not to tell others to get it done. Write this in. Don't just tell others to get it done. Sometimes you got to get it done yourself. When we talk about modeling next week, if your kids can't see you serving them, they don't get it. The reason we are raising a self-centered generation of kids, parents, you ready for this, is we got a self-centered generation of parents raising them. They see us serving, they learn to serve. They see us waiting for others to serve us, they learn to wait for others to serve them. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can practice serving on me. Tell them. <laughs> Just want to help you out. You know, just, just want to offer to, to be part of, the, part of the deal there. Love takes action. It's not a feeling. It's a behavior. Love takes action. It's the first part of becoming a servant. Secondly, love takes action. Write this in. We're going to build this as we go today by doing the worst task. Love takes action by doing the worst task. Jesus walks in. Sees there's nobody waiting on anyone in the room. So the scripture says, so he got up from the table, check it out, poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Now there's no way to, to, to possibly explain how gross a task this is. But I'm going to give it a shot. In Jesus' day, they wore open-toed sandals. They had not advanced to cowboy boots <laughs> in that day, okay? So they wear open-toed sandals. They have dirt roads, the same dirt roads that are walked by donkeys, by horses, by cattle, by sheep, and by goats, now, all of you who were raised in the country just got the picture. But to help the city folk among us, let me push this a little farther. You're stepping in animal poop all day long. It's in the road. It's everywhere. And the fancy meal of the day was the last meal of the day, and it was especially fancy on Thanksgiving on Passover. So the tradition was you'd come into the room, go over to a wash basin, no running water, got to keep that in mind, little basin with some water, wash your hands, remove your sandals, not by touching them with your hands. They had those where you could grab the strap. You know guys know how to do this, don't you? I mean, I can take my boots off without, well, shoot you. You know, you just, you just slip them off. The only problem now is I got to get it back on. They could slip their sandals off, you know, and they would literally do that and then go and recline at the table. Now, what's up with that recline at the table word? They didn't sit 
at a high table like we do. And by the way, isn't it unusual that the only time during the year we use the dining table is at fancy meals? I mean, we have a room set aside for three meals a year. It's funny how we do that. I'm not real sure how practical that is, but we, we've got one. Some are just going, no, we don't. We turned ours into a toy room. Way to go. <laughs> Makes sense to me. I think that's where the Wegos go. Yeah, I put the Legos in there, have a big time. I'm distracted. Back to it. <laughs> they sit at a low table. Often they sit cross-legged. Sometimes they put their feet flat out under the table in front of them. Sometimes they would actually kind of lay on one elbow and prop themselves up. Think about the meal when you're, when you're around the coffee table in the living room and everybody's just piled in really close. Now think about 12 men who've traveled all day over dusty roads and have animal poop between all of their toes sitting at the table for the meal. It was the task of the lowest servant available to wash feet. And after everybody washed their hands in that basin, they would pour that water out, pour fresh water in, and take that basin and go to the first person and take their feet and put them in it and wash them. I guarantee you it improved the smell of the room. I guarantee you it improved the pleasantness of the meal. This night, there's no servant, and these 12 disciples are playing the, I'm not doing this game. I did it last time the servant didn't show. I'm not doing it. Nope, not doing it. They're just waiting each other out. So Jesus walks in and does it. I want to see the video of this. I mean, God's got video of all this stuff. I want to see it. I want to see the look on their faces when he takes a base and starts washing their feet. Write this into your notes. This is a big idea. Washing feet in Jesus' day is basically poop removal. <laughs> now, you never thought you'd hear the word poop at church. There it is. It's poop removal, guys. That's exactly what it is. Love serves by cleaning up the mess. That's what love does. It doesn't run from the mess. It cleans it up. So let's make this practical. You men in the room who can't change a dirty diaper, grow up. Seriously. Seriously. Grow up. People who can't wash a dish because that's beneath them, do not catch the spirit of Jesus. He literally looked for the worst task and did it. Wow. That's what love does. It takes action by cleaning up the mess. When the Sutherland clan gets together, I'm talking about my siblings, you know, all the in-laws, outlaws, ex-laws, the big group of Sutherlands, which doesn't happen often because we're all chiefs and no Indians. I started 30 years ago when we got together washing the dishes. Now, I'd love to tell you that I did it because it was noble. I did it to get out of the conversation that went on after the meal. You know, the fighting conversation, you with me? The nyan, 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 nyan conversation, I just get up, clear the table, take as much time as I could washing the dishes. But it's become a way to serve my family. By cleaning up the mess. I've done it so long they expect me to do it. I kind of like that. Keeps me out of a lot of trouble. I have a great friend here in town. A guy I really love. His name is Brian Wright. We don't get a lot of time together. But he's just a cool pastor kind of guy. And he pastors over at Cedar Ridge Church. And I first met Brian Wright five years ago. He gave me his business card. And his title is really lead teaching pastor. But on his business card, it says, Brian Wright, spiritual janitor, Cedar Ridge Church. Here's the challenge. Become the spiritual janitor in your love relationships. Because that's what love does. Love takes action. 
Love takes action by doing the worst task. Here's the third point and maybe the toughest one. Love takes action by doing the worst task equally for all. Equally for all. Now, doggone it, this is where this gets personal for me. Jesus washed all his disciples' feet. Now, if it had been me, I'd have picked out the one or two that would feel bad the quickest, and I'd have washed their feet first, hoping that John would say, oh, Jesus, let me do that. i go, Phew, awesome, only had to wash one pair of stinky feet. You know, or, or I'd have picked out my favorites, you know, who, whose feet do I know are not too bad? Or who do I just, I'm so close to them, I could, I could handle their feet. Notice how Jesus did this, write it in. It's not just his favorites. Many of us are guilty of serving our favorites. In Kansas City, idolatry of family may be the biggest sin of all. We serve our family, just don't ask us to serve anybody else. Oh, we'll do anything for those that are our own. But our neighbor, yeah, he's got stinky feet. You know? That guy at work, man, his feet are really bad. That person from high school is still bugging me. It's hard for us to do the extreme. Jesus literally didn't just serve his favorite disciples. Notice this. He did not leave out the resistant. Would you write that down? I love the fact that when he comes to Peter, Peter, who always has both feet in his mouth, man, can I relate to this guy, says, not me, Jesus. You're not washing my feet. Uh -uh. No way. Yep, they're dirty. Yep, I want somebody to wash them. Not you. You're the master. I'm the servant. Ought to be the other way around. And Jesus, who's got to be tired of Peter's stubbornness after three years. Have you ever noticed how the stubborn child wears you out the fastest? <laughs> Parents, have you noticed? Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, I, I know on Sunday you act like you have all angels, but you don't. If you've got more than one kid, at least one of them has grown horns. And if they haven't, teenage years are coming. That stubborn child, that, st that child you got to tell a hundred times, that, that child that always resists, it's so easy to love the pleaser and to really struggle with the resistant. Jesus didn't leave him out. Not just his favorites. He did not leave out the resistant, but check this one out. This is the most amazing to me. He did not leave out the one who would betray him. In verse 2, there's an interesting thing thrown in early in the passage before the foot washing starts. It says, Jesus already knows that Judas is going to betray him. But he still washes the feet of Judas. Wow. Really, Lord? Okay, I get the don't play favorites part, and I can handle that, and I get the wash of the resistant part. But Lord, this person that's hurt me, this person that's betrayed me, this person that has walked out on me, this person that's lied to me, I'm supposed to watch their feet? Jesus did. Over in the book of Romans, it says when you do the nicest thing, to the nastiest people, it drives them nuts. In Matthew, it talks about pouring coals of fire on their head. Can I translate it? It fries their brain when you're nice to them and they've been nasty to you. I love doing this. I mean, seriously, I love doing it. The nastier you are to me, I'm going to go out of my way. I'm going to turn on the southern charm. I'm going to talk even more Texican than I normally do. I'm going to say, why, well, how can I help you? Well, bless you, brother. I appreciate you telling me you can't stand me. <laughs> that's, that's just incredible to know. What can I do to serve you? They just look at you like, are you on drugs? Jesus didn't just serve his favorites. He didn't just serve those who were pleasers. He didn't just serve those who were with him. 
He served them all equally. Love takes action. Always. Love takes action by doing the worst task. Would it be cool if we got to the point where every setting we walk into, we'd say, what's the crummiest task that needs to be done here? I'll do it. And love serves by taking action, by doing the worst task equally for all. Now, a couple of concluding thoughts today. We're not quite done, so stay with me. Stay with me. I'm going to give you two concluding thoughts and two applications today. Because if love serves is the teaching and love shows up by serving is the teaching, then to just have an intellectual teaching without a practical way to do it doesn't fit at all. So here's the first of those last thoughts. You ready? I serve those I truly love. If you love somebody, you serve them. Even when it's hard. Even when they're resistant. Even when they betray you, you serve them. Here at Westside, we love kids. There's a reason this place is called Westside Family Church. Check this out. Hey, we want to invite each and every one of you to come and be a part of family ministry. As we move into the fall, we have an opportunity to serve thousands of kids on a weekly basis. And we want to encourage you, if you're not serving, uh, family ministry is a great way to do that. As we reach a thousand new families, we're going to need your help. So we want to encourage you to fill out the card today and we will get in contact with you over the next week or so. Thanks. In your bulletin today, there's a card that says, I'd like to find out about volunteering with family ministry. You may not know, but every weekend at Westside, one-third of our crowd, between 16 and 1,800 people every weekend, are under the age of 18. And it is a phenomenal ministry, a great way to get involved. If you'd like to serve today, start with people that you love. Serve some kids you can fill out that Connect card. The second thing I want you to write in your notes on concluding thoughts, and then I'll give you an application for it as well, is this. I love Jesus when I'm willing to serve others in his name. The Christ follower who says, I love Jesus, yes I do. I'm sitting on my bodiggity. How about you? Bad poem, good point. Really messes me up. Because love 
serves. This fall, we're going to be starting a series in mid-September where we're talking about the trouble in our lives and how do we deal with it. If you're interested in helping us with that, here's one way. There's another card in your, another tear-off in your bulletin today about hosting a six-week study in your home. How many of you were in one of our 40-day groups last fall? Hands up. It was a phenomenal church-wide experience. We're hoping to do the same sort of thing. This six-week series will fit with the weekend teaching. And to host a group means that you're willing to have a group in your home, open it up, serve some snacks, tell others about it, turn on a DVD, and watch God work. I hope that you'll help us out by hosting, especially if you've never led a group before or never been in a group. Church, here's a prophecy and we're going to stop. You ready? God's going to give you some really poopy opportunity to serve somebody this week. I mean, it's going to be slimy. It's going to have your kidding me, God, written on it. Because when we talk about loving Jesus enough to take on the worst task, he'll give us a worse task to see if we're serious about it. Let's serve this week. See you next week when we talk about love models. God bless.